Hello, thank you for that introduction. Uh, so uh, I'm Julie, uh, I manage the health data science team at Twitter. And if you've ever been on the opposite end of a hiring manager interview with me, you know that when we talk about health at Twitter, we're talking about our anti-abuse, anti-spam, and anti-misleading information efforts, but also pro the good things that keep Twitter interesting and a compelling platform. Um, I want to thank the PyData organizers for asking me to speak. Um, and when they first reached out, I was a little confused. I'm still fairly early in my career. So a little over five years ago, I was sitting in the 17th floor of RLM trying to deal with the existential crisis that arises when you ask yourself, so what actually happens after I finish writing this thesis? And so uh, I thought that I, this might be a good opportunity to sort of demystify what it's like to do data science and to speak to my experiences to show that it's not that scary, it's not that mysterious, and, and it's a lot of really cool, impactful work that you can do. So like any good data scientist, I would like to set a, a baseline and to provide the context from which I am sharing these experiences. Uh, so, as I said, I got my PhD from the University of Texas, where I studied the chemical composition of the oldest observable stars in our galaxy. Grad school was a really challenging and interesting experience for me, um, part of which uh, being due to the fact that in my incoming class, there were 10 of us and I was the only woman. Um, and towards the end of grad school, many of us were really feeling that academia wasn't the place for us. But I had spent a lot of time feeling kind of isolated from the rest of my classmates, and so their notions of data science as this thing that they wanted to do didn't really resonate with me. Uh, and so my response was to try something different. So I went to a coding boot camp called Hackbright Academy. Hackbright Academy is aimed at increasing the number of women and non-binary folks in tech. Um, and the way that the boot camp runs, which is I'm guessing similar to Galvanize, uh, is the first half is coursework and then the second half you do a project. I was very convinced I would not be a data scientist, so I did an unsupervised machine learning project that I stuck into a Flask app and therefore it was a website. Um, at the end, they uh, introduce you to different companies uh, and you do interviews with these companies. And so one of the companies that I interviewed with um, asked me to interview with their data science team in addition to their developer team. And I was confused. I'm like, but I just spent 10 whole weeks learning how to be a web developer. And they're like, but that PhD makes us think that you could also be a data scientist. So I ended up getting an offer for both positions as a developer and as a data scientist. And the developer role was to start with CSS and work your way towards the back of the stack. Um, and if anybody knows me here personally, I am not organized enough to think well in CSS, so that seemed like a bad idea. Or on the data science side, I could solve really interesting problems around entity resolution and, and attribution questions in the ad tech space. So I decided to become a data scientist. Um, and it was a really good decision for me for a number of different reasons. Uh, and I think one of the most critical components of that was my manager. My manager uh, was a former physicist, and so he knew kind of the world that I was coming from. And he provided a really nice landing spot between academia and industry, because they are very different. Uh, and one of the ways in which he really encouraged me to like get introduced to industry, to understand different patterns of, of how people engage and interact, and, and just meet more people who weren't thinking about, you know, uh, uh, like stars for, for a little bit. Um, he, he encouraged me to go to meetups and conferences. So I kept going to the PyLadies meetups because like I knew Python from this, this boot camp um, and there weren't very many Fortran meetups in San Francisco at the time. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, I, I went and like they were interesting, it was like this is this web framework, or this is like this thing that does this other thing, and then there's some infrastructure stuff. And I was like, so when are you gonna do the data science talks? I'm, I'm just like waiting. It's like, I know that there's this like entire sci-fi stack, and people have been using like pandas and matplotlib, and I wanna hear like more about that. And finally, they, they threw it back at me, and they're like, well, why don't you organize one? And I was like, good question, why don't I? And so I just kept asking enough questions, and finally I became an organizer. Uh, and so I put on um, a few different data science events, and they just took, because people are really, really excited about data science, right? Um, and so right now, um, I live here, so I'm no longer an organizer for PyLadies SF, but the data science component of PyLadies is still really strong uh, in the San Francisco branch. 
I have a similar story with the SciPy conference in that uh, I went to my first SciPy conference in 2015 and I looked around and they were like, hmm, I just spent like 10 weeks with like a whole cohort cohort of women, but like there didn't seem to be that many women around. And so I kept asking the organizers for diversity statistics and like what they were doing to try to like increase the number of women and folks from minoritized backgrounds at the conference. And finally they asked me, well, why don't you just become diversity chair? And so I was diversity chair from 2016 to 2018. Uh, and it was amazing to watch uh, just how not even that much intentional effort could vastly improve the experience uh, and the inclusivity of a conference that is so meaningful to so many people. Um, eventually, I moved on from my first company and made my way to Twitter, uh, where I started out as a, an individual contributing data scientist, became a tech lead, and then got into management like many people do. Um, so I keep saying data science, but like data science means so many different things to so many different people. It depends on who you ask, the time of day, what company they're currently at, um, and, and it's kind of just like this wide open term. Um, but I do think that there are certain things that tie data science together as, as a field. So like a, a little side story, uh, I have a seven-year-old daughter, she goes to Hill Elementary, um, but before, uh, before we moved to Texas, we were trying to figure out where to send her to school. And so uh, we were about to put her in kindergarten and we were touring some kindergarten classrooms. And I walked into uh, one of the classrooms and I saw this bulletin board and it's what scientists do. And it's scientists communicate information, they make observations, they look for patterns, they ask questions, they support their ideas with evidence, they use math, they make and use models, they do investigations, they get information from lots of different sources. And this is a really good distillation of what scientists do. But I would also argue that this is like one of the best distillations I've ever seen of what data scientists do. Data scientists do all of these different things, but, but in a really specific context. And what I really like about this is that this is so simple that a kindergartner is supposed to be able to understand this, right? Um, and so even though like how data science manifests at different companies can change, it, it does stick to these sort of core functions of data science as a role. Um, and data science is exciting. Why, why, why even bother understanding this? So if you look at this chart, this is the Google search trends over time. So it's starting in uh, 2004, almost no one was looking at data science. And it's been steadily increasing um, ever since, let's say, 2012-ish or so. Um, when you go to Glassdoor, if you look for the 50 best jobs in America for 2019, it's data scientists. And I've given a similar talk to this like over the years and I can keep pointing to this and I just update the year because like it, it's been number one for the last four years I think. Similarly on LinkedIn, if you look at this, the, the most promising jobs in the US for 2019, data scientist was number one. I guess I would rather be a LinkedIn data scientist than a Glassdoor one since the median base salary is higher in LinkedIn. Uh, the other thing I wanna point out uh, since this is uh, PyData is that if you look at the related topics, you have Python for, for data science, um, and you don't see some other things. <laughs> uh, cool. So what does data science look like at Twitter? So at Twitter, we have a consumer data science organization, and when you think of Twitter, the app, your home timeline, your notifications, your DMs, somebody in the consumer data science org has likely done an analysis or run an experiment or created a model to better understand that surface area or that product to make the best decisions for our users. Um, and so we have teams that cover many different areas. So user behavior and growth, like what are users doing and what are the things that compel them to come back to the platform uh, and what are the things that convince new users to, to join. Um, understanding our top line company metrics is like part, part of this as well. Uh, we also have teams that are dedicated to understanding what content gets created and who consumes them. And most importantly, how do we connect those folks creating this really engaging, vibrant, exciting content and, and tie those 
folks to the people who really want to see that information. Um, we have a team that is dedicated to experimentation. And it's not just running A-B tests, but it's really helping us define how we view experimentation as a company and to, to know that we are making the best, let's say, statistical decisions when we're running these these experiments. Uh, we have a data visualization team, and their Twitter handle is at Twitter Data. And if you go to interactive.twitter.com, you can see some of the work that they've published. And it's super cool because like, they are able to take the power of, of the fire hose and all of Twitter data and display it in ways that are compelling and engaging and, and just fun. So if you're a big fan of Game of Thrones, highly recommend uh, checking that out. Uh, and then finally, we have the health data science team. Uh, and I'll talk a lot more about that because this is my team. And this is the lens through which I have experienced and, and driven data science at scale. Um, so let's step back a little bit. So why does health data science matter? So Biz Stone is one of the co-founders of Twitter. And uh, on January 21st, he, he tweeted, we serve the public conversation. Uh, and so what does that mean? What, what does it mean to be public? Twitter, Twitter should be a public space. Twitter should be a place where everybody feels open to share their ideas, opinions, information, and, and for people to converse with each other, right? But it's really hard to do that if you feel like you don't belong or you feel like it's not safe for you to do so. So the health data science team <clears throat> uh, works closely with the health organization. And this is our team charter. So we work with the health organization to hashtag fix the internet to make data-driven decisions through research and analysis, innovations around metrics, methods, experimentation, and more to ensure that Twitter is a safe and informative experience for our customers. This is like a lot, and like it's pretty like lofty, right? But I want to kind of get into some examples of what does this really actually mean? Because I think like with a lot of things in data science or tech in general, people talk about stuff at a really high level without actually detailing like what does it mean to do this day to day. So what do we do? So we are involved in goal setting and prioritization. We want to make sure that when engineering product design user research decide that this project is really important, that it's actually something that will keep users safe. Not just because people intuitively think that it should matter, but because we have the data to back that up. Because any of these efforts aren't free. They take time, they take, they cost engineering hours, they cost product hours, uh, and, and it's possible that they, they won't work. And so we want to be as sure as possible that this is something that is worth investing in. We do a lot of opportunity sizing and prototyping. So somebody has an idea to fix part of, of, of a problem. And so like how many users do we think that this will impact? And to what degree? Is this a really a big problem? Or is it something that is uh, like maybe like less, less severe? Uh, and and we, you, we have to make these trade-offs all the time. Do you go for something that is like the most severe but maybe only affects a few people? Or do you go for something that's like more widely like unliked, but like affects much more, many more people. And so we work really closely with folks in product and policy to try to make these decisions and to try to help give them as much information as possible so that they can make the best judgments that they possibly can. Um, we do a lot of experimentation at Twitter in general. And experimentation in the health space is interesting because there are ethical implications. If there's something that we think truly helps our users be safer or get better information, then who are we to keep that from them? Um, that's not to say that we never do experiments because sometimes we're not sure and we need to run this experiment to really see what the impact is to see if it's worth it. Um, and so it means that we have to come up with novel ways of doing A-B tests for safety features. Um, it means that we need to be integrated into the rest of the product surface areas, not just within health but across the platform because sometimes you have something that might increase logins or something that like might increase the number of tweets created, but it also, measurably reduces the safety of, of the, the platform for our users. Um, and so it's really important for us to have these kind of like cross-functional collaborations to, to drill into that and to understand what we're really doing for and to our users when we make changes. Uh, we also do impact analyses. So kind of getting back to the, the point of sometimes it's just not ethical to do these experiments. When we come up with a new policy, like my favorite example, fake example, is like Twitter is a bird company, uh, and we know that cats are bad for birds. So if we decide that cat content on the platform is just the worst and we need to get rid of it, who are we to only enforce that for part of the population? Because there's no way to truly understand the impact of something because of the network effects that happen, for instance. But also, 
from like a, a sort of like empathy to our user standpoint, it's just not fair, right? And so we need to sometimes be able to just move quickly without having to do an experiment. Um, and then, but, but that doesn't mean that we don't want to understand how it works, right? And so that's where impact analyses and more correlational analyses come, come into play. Um, and then one of the things that we've been doing a lot this year are product metrics and investigations. So how do we measure the health of Twitter? And it's a really big question because Part of the problem with health or abuse or whichever way you want to look at it, it's, it's latent. It's not something where you can go out and count the number of logins or you can count the number of clicks or you can see how much ad revenue is generated. It's something completely different and, and sometimes it's, it's subjective, it's a feeling. How are users feeling and how do you measure that and how do you make sure that you're measuring it in a way that is reproducible? Um, and so what happens when we see these metrics and when we see these metrics move? And what are the things that we should be doing to, again, ensure that users have feelings of safety and can get to the information that they really want? Um, so I'm gonna walk through a few different um, kind of high-level examples of, of initiatives that we've taken. So one of the biggest initiatives that we've had is reducing the visibility of potentially abusive content. So we have different services like within the, the platform where we will take content that we believe to potentially be abusive and to move it uh, to lower visibility. So that way users know you can click here, but there are dragons and this is your choice to look at them. Um, where people who are maybe more casually browsing really don't need to see this content that they, they don't want. Uh, and the ways in which data science have engaged in this uh, are to try to figure out how do you measure this and how do you actually figure out where the line is between something that's potentially abusive and something that's like probably okay. Uh, and, and it's required a lot of iteration and testing because it's a very subjective kind of feeling that, that users have that we're trying to proxy into. Uh, we also have something called the quality filter. The quality filter uh, takes all the app mentions that you get and makes a decision as to whether or not we will show you a notification that you've been at mentioned by someone. Um, and a lot of app mentions are sort of drive-by or, or abusive app mentions or drive-bys, people that you don't know, people who are at mentioning you and saying something really terrible and then moving on. And so by suppressing those notifications, you don't have to see something that you don't want to see. Um, and what we found is that this led to a 40% reduction in blocks following app mentions from people who you don't follow. So somebody that you haven't opted in to their, uh, their in engagement and interaction. Um, we also have taken steps to stop potential abuse in its tracks. Um, so we have something that like people have deemed the timeout. And so when we see users are posting a lot of abusive content over a short period of time, we will take users and we will limit their account functionality, meaning that they can tweet but we will, be not send, we will not be sending notifications to people who do not follow them. Uh, and what we saw was this uh, limited functionality ended up in 25% fewer abuse reports on those users. So like, we were able to reduce like, the, uh, and, and mitigate the amount of abuse these, these accounts were, were propagating on the platform. I think the other thing that's really interesting here is that of the accounts that are put into this timeout, 65% of them are put into timeout once. So it's not just about remediation, but it's also about rehabilitation. And users can see, like, you can't just take your bad mood out on the internet in, in ways that you maybe want to. We've also developed a, a suite of user controls. So users can control who they get notifications from. And so you can choose to not receive notifications um, from particular sets of people. So people who you don't follow, people who don't follow you, uh, people who have brand new accounts, people who have just created an account and they have never changed their, their profile photo, and then other users who haven't necessarily completely shared who they are with Twitter itself. Um, similarly, you can mute content. So you can mute words that show up in your home timeline and in, in your notifications. I think kind of one of the funniest stories around this is that this isn't just good for abuse, although we have done a, a lot of work to, to understand like victims of abuse, they do use this feature and they do use this feature for abusive words. Um, 
but this was launched around the same time as the Gilmore Girls revival. And Gilmore Girls ended up being one of the top muted keywords uh, during that time period. So this has uh, multiple purposes. Health is good for everyone. Um, and then the last kind of high level thing I wanna talk about is our reporting system. So users are allowed and encouraged to report content that they think is in violation of our terms of service. Uh, but one of the things that is true is that users are not great at really understanding our rules. My favorite example of this is we have a private information uh, part of our, our, our terms of service. Um, and you can't reveal private information about people. So one of the reports that I've seen come in under private information uh, was at so-and-so farts in his sleep. And like, if I farted in my sleep, I would not want the entire internet to know that. It's true. But that's not actually what we mean by private information. We're talking about doxing. Um, and so we want to make sure that like the reports that do come in that truly are about violative content are ones that we can put in front of a human agent so they can review. Uh, because another thing that is very true about abuse is that it's very context dependent. And so having a human in the loop really helps ensure that like we have the correct context around like the, the tweet and the interaction to, to understand if it did truly violate our terms of service. Uh, so we worked with uh, the machine learning team and we developed machine learning models to predict which reports we believed uh, were actual violations of our terms of service. And so we use those to uh, prioritize which reports actually get shown to human agents in, in which order. All of these efforts are, are just kind of attacking parts of the problem uh, because as it turns out, like there are lots of bad actors on the internet, um, and and they all use different methods. And so you have to have an ensemble of methods to try to fight against this, especially because like abuse and spam and just basically anti-safety on the internet is a really adversarial space, and it's something where we need to, as a company, keep growing and evolving. And this is where data science comes in. We need to like help the company really understand like the different attack vector vectors and the different trends that we were seeing to try to help uh, our, our partners in engineering and product and policy come up with the new rules and like the new systems uh, to, to really make users safer. So overall, like we've seen 16% fewer abuse reports after uh, an interaction from an account where the reporter doesn't follow. We've seen three times more abusive accounts that are suspended within 24 hours after uh, they are first reported than the year before. And more than 50% of the abusive content that is enforced um, is proactively surfaced. So we want to take users out of the loop so that the burden is not on them to report violative content, but to find it ourselves and make sure that we can proactively take it down. Um, so these are kind of high level, but I wanted to get into more details of how this works for a particular project that we, we've been um, more public about. Um, and, and this is suspension evasion. So let's say you're a bad person on the internet, um, and you do something so bad that we say that you are suspended from the platform. Once you are suspended from the platform, you are no longer allowed to create new accounts uh, to go continue to proliferate your, your, your abuse. However, you're a bad actor on the internet, and so you're incentivized to do this, and you're like, ha, huh, what rules apply to me? So you create a new account. It is up to us to detect these users and then remediate them appropriately. So how does data science fit into this, right? Um, there are many different ways where we were involved, and, and this was like a really interesting project because we were involved in every step along the way. I mentioned earlier that I worked, uh, my first job was in ad tech. Um, and I think ad tech gets a, like a bad rap because you know it's like soulless and it's ruining the internet. But the thing about ad tech is that it actually funds the internet. And so there's part of it that like until like new business models arise, like ad tech will always be part of the internet. And I, I do want to make a, a small defense in, in, in favor of ad tech. Um, and that's because because it funds the internet, it, it has funding. Uh, and ad tech generates some of the largest data sets on the internet. And so there are actual interesting math problems in this space. And so 
one of the things that I think you can do in ad tech is you can take the methods that you develop to solve those problems and apply them to other spaces. And so one of the things that I worked on at my first company was entity resolution. So finding out which pieces of inform disparate information point to the same entity or user. Uh, and this is something, this is exactly what the suspension evasion problem is. You have a user who is suspended and you need to create some sort of linkage between that suspended user and new accounts that have been created by, by the same person. Um, and so data science was really critical here because we needed to figure out what of the matching algorithms did we think performed best under whatever set of metrics that we were, were we're considering. Um, how many entities can we resolve using these matching algorithms that we liked? And then what are the kinds of users that we catch with these matching algorithms? And I've drawn this like little circle thing here because they're all interrelated. At some point, it's not just about, you know, you can't always just like look at numbers and you have the answer. Uh, I, a lot of people talk about like data science is making data-driven thinking, and I probably actually have that in the slides here somewhere too. But in some ways, you have to be more data-informed. You can't always be data-driven. If you're purely data-driven, um, as, as one of my friends who used to work as a PM at Google used to say, there would be a porn tab in the Google image searches, right? So like, you have to also make these decisions based on data um, with knowing what your product is. And, and so for us, on the data science side in this project, we needed to understand and, and have an opinion over what kinds of users we wanted to, to catch. So like, did people spew a bunch of like hatred and, and violence and then go create a new account to talk about their kids' soccer team? Or were they creating new accounts to actually be abusive? And it turns out that they were creating accounts to, to proliferate their very bad worldview uh, again after they had been suspended. Um, so once we figured out that there truly was an opportunity and that these were the ways in which that we wanted to <clears throat> tackle the, the problem, uh, we needed to develop some metrics to really figure out the ways in which we are handling this, are they correct? And so this is a lot more prototyping. And so whenever you develop a metric, not even just for this purpose, but in general, you need to think about several different things. And this isn't everything, but these are some of, I think, the highlights. Does this metric actually measure the purpose of the product or the, the workflow or the whatever the thing it is that you're evaluating? Like, how relevant is it? Um, how does the metric move, and is it in meaningful ways? Is it really noisy, and is it something where if there's any exogenous effect that, like, it just goes up and down? Like, is it, is it just, like, so noisy and the variance is so high that it's not meaningful? <clears throat> does a metric not move at all? Uh, and so sometimes you, you have to ask yourself, do you want a leading indicator or a lagging indicator, right? Um, what biases or assumptions are baked in? Anytime you, like, do a select star from a place, uh, you're making a choice and you're baking in an assumption um, and it's probably introducing some kind of bias. And you might want that bias, right? Like, we want to understand what the people that we think are doing bad things on the internet are doing, right? We don't care to remediate users who are acting in good faith and, and participating in healthy ways, right? So like our bias is to look at users who are abusive, for instance. Um, but you have to really ask yourself when you're measuring things, like what, what is it that you, uh, assumptions are you making and how does that change the outcome? And then finally, I think, from a business standpoint, this, this last like kind of set of questions is, the difference between having fun times with math and being an effective data scientist. Is the metric interpretable? When I say this thing is like 12, do people understand what 12 means? Um, is it actionable? Can you make decisions from looking at that number, right? Like, or is this just like a vanity metric where you're patting yourself on the back for like launching this thing? Um, and then the other question that I think is always important to ask is, is it gameable? How would I, like the, the crafty PM, like guide the engineering team to do a thing to like beat this metric and, and look good, even at the expense of some other things? Um, and it's not always like a bad thing if something is gameable. That, that also uh, might mean that like it goes back to the, the point that like metrics aren't always forever. Sometimes you need to like update how you measure things because your problem has changed. Um, 
So my team is a team of data scientists, um, plus one long-suffering data engineer who's very sad at our ability to use JIRA. Um, and so uh, the metric productionization was like, let's say like less straightforward than, than you would imagine. So uh, our data scientists created uh, an ad hoc pipeline to gather data from various sources in various ways, using various joins. Um, we used a SciPy stack to manipulate the pipeline data uh, to try to figure out like how we wanted to construct our metrics. Um, and then we did an evaluation to see which each of these manipulations actually measured um, because we had some, some labels from like different sources. Um, and once we settled on like the way that we wanted to measure the problem, we needed to productionize the pipeline. Um, it turns out though that you can't just like sort of throw things like over the fence to engineering and hope it all works out. Um, having a, a data engineer or an engineering team that can productionize this but also understands like data and data science and, and metrics is like really critical to making sure that these systems work in the way that you want them. Um, and so we worked really closely with our data engineering team to ensure that what we wanted to measure was actually measured the way that we we wanted and had prototyped out, as opposed to making certain assumptions that like can happen in how you join data or like how you do ratios uh, and, and stuff like that. And so, at the end, what it resulted in is. Uh, we tweeted this. So we suspended accounts for attempting to evade a suspension, um, and we were able to like have a really immediate and important impact because we were able to take these accounts off the platform to make it better for the people who want to be there to have these public conversations. So this brings me back to this tweet. Um, so again, Biz says we serve the public conversation. Um, and as I like look out into this room, and I, I think about like, what does like the population of the world look like? This isn't particularly representative, right? This is a biased sample. Um, and I think that part of being successful, especially in a consumer facing company, is to make sure that you truly can empathize with your users. And some of that means needing to have better demographic representation of your user base and the people who are working day after day, especially when you're in the space of data science and machine learning because the company is making decisions like in an automated fashion around things that will definitely affect users. And without having the demographic representation of your user base, sometimes people just forget. Um, so Twitter is really committed to making sure that we are an inclusive and diverse tech company. Um, and we say this is how we'll serve the public conversation, but I think that it gets more to it. It's about making sure that like, as a company, we really actually are here to serve our users and to make sure that Twitter as like, almost like a public good is something that can be used for everyone. Thanks. <laughs>